By the mid-1990s, audiences had grown tired of the played-out formula of typical teen horror movies, popularized by lackluster sequels and inferior imitators. When even previously unstoppable horror icons such as Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Freddy Krueger failed to deliver even modest box office returns, it seemed as if a staple of cinema just might fade into obscurity. Horror movies are a very specific genre and they tend to go in cycles of what's being done at any given time. Um, in the 80s, there was the slasher, and the slasher picture really became the kind of horror movie. Starting with Halloween, and then you had your Friday the 13th, your Nightmare on Elm Street, um, and then House on Sorority Row, and all those kinds of movies. Those movies had kind of played themselves out. The lead characters, the killers, were kind of being seen as, uh, as a joke. They were seen as funny. They weren't so scary anymore. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little soul, too! <laughs> Maybe just that it was at a time when the horror genre was not doing very well. So people weren't really making them. No one was doing it. By the mid-90s, the horror genre was, was truly dead. It seemed as though the film industry and audiences were prepared to let the typical stock and slash horror film rest in peace. Against this backdrop, one devout fan of the genre, 25-year-old Kevin Williamson, was desperately seeking to gain a foothold in the film business. Kevin had been kind of in town working at, you know, relatively minor writing jobs. This was sort of the beginning of his career. He wasn't, he hadn't written a lot of things before this. After struggling to find work as an actor in New York City, Kevin Williamson's first attempt at crafting a screenplay came after making the move to Hollywood in 1991, but it would take four long years before Williamson would get his first break as a writer. I read uh, Kevin's very first script, Killing Mrs. Tingle, which I just thought was remarkable. Great characters, amazing dialogue, he really had a gift. Although Killing Mrs. Tingle sold to independent production company Interscope Communications, it languished in development hell, leaving Williamson to wonder if the film would ever be produced. Because of this, he found himself struggling once again to find work in the highly competitive trenches of Hollywood. We were looking to find him a job off of the sale of Killing Mrs. Tingle, and the horror franchises that le had led up to that moment had all kind of petered out. They were all kind of fading away, so it wasn't exactly the sexiest thing to be out looking for a horror job. So in, that, in truth, we were having a hard time finding Kevin a great gig. To make ends meet, Kevin Williamson took a job house-sitting for a friend. It was this decision and his financially desperate situation that put him at the right place at the right time, allowing him to catch a news program about a very disturbing subject. He was house-sitting and he was watching a TV special about real murders and uh, kind of started scaring himself as he was watching it. Williamson had a right to be scared as he sat alone in the quiet house, watching the very real story of an infamous Florida serial killer. A tale so terrifying and so unbelievable, it seemed like something right out of a scary movie. Between November 1989 and August 1990, Danny Rowling murdered five students in Gainesville, Florida. Local media dubbed him the Gainesville Ripper. Her body was also posed and her head was left on a shelf as though to shock whomever walked into the scene. Rowling would break into the apartments and dormitories of unsuspecting college students torturing, decapitating, sexually assaulting, and mutilating his victims, posing them grotesquely to highlight the chaos and carnage he had caused. The case had finally come together, and on November 15, 1991, Danny Rowling was indicted to stand trial as the Gainesville killer. The horrifying true story of the Gainesville Ripper was an eerie reminder to Williamson of his favorite fright film, Halloween, a bona fide genre classic the tale of unstoppable killer Michael Myers had terrified Williamson as a 12-year-old child as much as it had inspired him. The great thing about Kevin is he'd seen every horror movie, and for him, Halloween was the seminal movie. You know, he loves Halloween, and he loves the genre, and he has that wicked sense of humor. He had called a friend, I guess, to kind of help him feel more relaxed. Instead, they ended up talking about scary movies and what's your favorite scary movie and all that. What's your favorite scary movie? I don't know. You have to have a favorite. What comes to mind? Um, Halloween. You know, the one with the guy in the white mask who walks around and stalks babysitters? 
And that was the genesis of what eventually became Scream. From that one frightening night, an idea for a new kind of horror movie was born. One that would rely on the conventions of the horror movies Williamson had loved as a boy. The story came to him quickly. And I went off um, to the desert for three days and locked myself in a room and I pounded it out. Literally went to Palm Springs and wrote the script for Scary Movie, which is remarkable. I thought someone else was going to come along and make a scary movie or make a teenage movie and I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to have missed my chance. And there was another, even more compelling reason for his urgency. I was so desperate when I wrote it. I couldn't pay my bills, and my car payment was due, and, my, and I was three months behind on my rent. And he just let himself go and write it the way he thought, and I think that's always the, uh, the key to a really great script. Williamson took a gamble by crafting a screenplay that blended the cliches of his favorite horror movies with his own brand of dark humor. But would Hollywood respond to a scary movie that dared to mix in a healthy dose of comedy with its terror? Do you like scary movies, Sydney? In 1994, Kevin Williamson, a struggling actor turned screenwriter, conceived of a brand new idea for a horror film that would turn every genre cliche on its head. But even lifelong horror fan Williamson wasn't sure what Hollywood's reaction would be to his unconventional script. He was so nervous when he gave it to us because he thought for sure we were just going to, you know, think that it was a dreadful idea and, uh, and that uh, it was the worst timing in the world. But Williamson's innovative concept paid off. The script he was hoping would turn his life around was an immediate hit with those who read it. When I read the script, I thought, uh, I thought it was brilliant. I think it was, you get a lot of scripts and, and they, they can take forever to read because they're dull or n not interesting, not original. And um, with Scream, it was a real page turner. And it was perfect. It was perfectly written. Right off the bat, it was really terrifying. It was so out of the blue, so unexpected to receive a script that good. Yeah, one of the things I loved about it when I first read it was it self-awareness. But at the same time, there was a real uh, humorous element. It didn't take itself too seriously. Then you should know Jason's mother, Mrs. Voorhees, was the original killer. Jason didn't show up until the sequel. I really wrote the script for the read because I wanted to sell it. I wanted people in Hollywood to go, oh, this is some cool dialogue. There's some cool characters. These are some cool plot twists. And it wasn't long before Hollywood responded. In terms of devising a strategy, we chose the smartest and best producers we could think of that could help to strengthen the project and in going into financiers. By the end of the day, there was four or five people bidding on it. Everyone else had called and said, we like it, we're going to buy it, but we hadn't heard from Miramax yet. Williamson and his agents were hoping for a call from the boldest brothers of independent film, Bob and Harvey Weinstein, whose studio, Miramax Films, had already blazed a Hollywood trail with a string of Oscar-winning films, such as Pulp Fiction, The English Patient, and Sling Blade. As luck would have it, Bob Weinstein had recently begun a new upstart division that would focus solely on genre fare. He called his sister company, which had already acquired the rights to the Hellraiser and Halloween franchises, Dimension Films. I had told the people that were working for me the kind of movie that I was looking for, something that would be different than just the rest. And um, I had an assistant named Richard Potter. And I remember one day calling me up and says, I think I just read the script that you described. I called him and I said, Bob, I just read a script. If you don't want to make this movie, then I don't know what you're looking for. So he laughed and said, well, I guess I better read it then. And I read it and I loved it and I uh, bid uh, for it. But with other major suitors, such as Paramount, Universal, and Morgan Creek already circling the script, Dimension Films knew they had to get in the game fast. As the days went on, a bidding war drove the script's price higher and higher. And as the stakes rose, previously interested parties dropped out until only two players were left standing. The two produ production entities that emerged as the most competitive were Kerry Woods and Kathy Conrad on one side, and Dan Halstead and Oliver Stone on the other side. Surprisingly, the writer and director of high-profile films such as Platoon, Wall Street, and JFK had also decided he wanted to scoop up the hottest spec script in town. But it happened to be at a time when Williamson got the call he was waiting for. The next morning, it was like 9 o'clock in the morning, we got a call from Miramax. So, you know, it's saying, okay, Bob read it, 
He loved it. He wants to buy it. How much? How much would become an important question when it came time to decide which buyer would ultimately make Scary Movie. There is a bidding war uh, that when our offer comes in, it is not as high as some of the other offers. And the decision to accept one of those offers could only come from Kevin Williamson. Bob understood it. Bob loved the genre. I mean, Halloween was one of his favorite movies. It was one of my favorite movies. We bonded instantly. He's like the uh, Quentin Tarantino of like filmology when it comes to every reference and every character that ever was in a horror movie. By acquiring the hottest spec script in town, Dimension Films solidified their future as a major player in the world of genre movies. It also changed Kevin Williamson's life forever with an initial check for $400,000 and the start of a career which would make him the new voice of a generation. Kevin really, really had his finger on the pulse of the modern American teenager. I'm going to swing by the video store. I was thinking Tom Cruise and all the right moves. You know, if you pause it just right, you can see his penis. A lot of what Tatum said specifically, she brought a lot of the modern pop culture thing into it. And then obviously the Jamie Kennedy character, the Matthew Lillard character, the whole... It's a very savvy, funny, witty kids. Kizu, kiss, kizu, is easy. The dialogue in, in the Scream script was amazing. I mean, you read it, it just felt real or beyond real. You know, it felt like these kids were so smart, and the fact that that was written, and the fact that they were aware of horror movies. What movie is this from? I spit on your garage. It's home watching television. The, uh, the Exorcist was on. What's that werewolf movie with E.T.'s mom in it? The Howling Horror, straight ahead. Having officially made his entrance as a legitimate Hollywood player, everyone was buzzing about the hottest new screenwriter in town, a man who had found a niche that had been missing from the cinematic landscape for over a decade, a movie about teenagers and high school life that felt real, timely, and generation-specific. He took the John Hughes formula and the slasher formula and made it feel modern and contemporary. And the film itself definitely was sort of hip and... and um focused towards a, a younger generation. Definitely felt like a John Hughes movie gone to hell. Those kids in the John Hughes movies felt like modern, contemporary kids. Nothing could shock me anymore. Last night at the dance, my little brother paid a buck to see your underwear. Oh, really, Alicia? As if. Come on, sporto. Level with me. Do you slip her the hot beef injection? I want to see Jamie Lee's breast. When do yes. we see Jamie yes. Lee's breast? And I think perhaps uh, Scream became similar to one of those films. Kevin just has very literate characters who are talking about everything that's going on, and I think that's what made the script so appealing. She wants to kill herself, but she realizes that teen suicide is out this year, and homicide is a much healthier therapeutic expression. Where do you get this? Ricky you. Oh, you are pathetic. Kevin is the only one who can do that dialogue, and you believe it. Kevin really, really thought through everything. He really understood the structure and mythology of slasher films and red herring movies and just applied the John Hughes modern teenager to it. With a fresh take on an old genre, Dimension Films was ready to find a director for their horror hybrid. However, it began to seem as if Scary Movie would never get made when nearly every bankable horror director in town said no.